Slide making 101, uh, I'm going to give myself an F on uh, slide making with this um, whole program. I took it from a uh, sommelier course, really it's a uh, high level, just a ton of information. That, like I forget how many hundred slides that there are. So I took out the basic stuff that I thought um, you would find interesting, you should know for the test, which are questions that we thought uh, you ought to know. and. Um, uh, so I left a lot of the stuff on there that I'm, I'm going to tell you where you need to pay attention and where you don't. But uh, Slide Making 101 says that you should have seven lines of text and no more than seven words on a line. So we totally screwed that one up on these slides. Uh, I didn't make the slides. Uh, I did adapt them and I'm responsible for them so I'll give myself an F. What I expect you to get out of the following slides is not much. I'm going to pick out, uh, show you the parts that I do need you to get and for a lot of it, uh, there's just too many words. You're not going to read them all in. I don't want you to read them all. We're just going to glance at them. We're going to cover the main points. I'm going to let you know what it is that you need to know. And, I'm, and for the rest of it, I'm going to just want you to make some general notes that you can use uh, for your uh, for your just general use. So as we come to things, and you're going to write down Chardonnay and what's that a good uh, pairing with? What food does that pair well with? Uh, just write that stuff down and then I'm going to give you some reds and some bolds and tell you what some test questions are and those you are going to commit to memory. And I want you to know you have a book to look at when the need arises and you got Google that you can uh, check so uh, when it comes to serving a meal you can Google it. So that's why um, uh, <laughs> these slides are a mess. There's too many words. Let's talk about the foundations to uh, wine and food pairings. Pairing a glass of wine, whether it's extravagant wine or a humble wine uh, with a food can elevate a meal and the dining experience from main mundane to a special occasion because everything just worked. You taste the wine and it accents the food, you taste the food and it accents the wine and it's just a whole different experience. Kind of like going to the opera when somebody explains to you what the heck they're talking about up there, right? It, it just all makes sense, the wine and the food go together. The first step in designing an effective wine menu, whether that's for a dinner tonight or whether that's for a uh, restaurant, is to determine the type of cuisine you're going to offer. Are you a steakhouse, Italian, French, seafood, or if you're at home, are you uh, having steak, Italian, French, or seafood? Some other steps, how much do you want to pay for the wine? How much do you want to charge for the wine? If you're going to have an extensive wine list, that's important. You can only uh, put as much wine in your cellar as you can afford, right? And your people are only going to pay as much as you think they're going to, they're willing to spend. What's their demographic? If you're paying fifty dollars for a bottle of wine, do you think they're going to pay a hundred, hundred and fifty? Maybe yes. Determine the customer's demographic. What are they used to paying? What are they used to drinking? What is an effective wine and food pairing? Generally a successful wine and food pairing is one in which the interaction of wine and food enhances each other like one plus one equals three. People pair wine and food out of tradition and personal enjoyment such as hot dogs and beer at a ball game just go together. We're used to that. Every dish is dynamic and can be comprised of thousands of food ingredients and infinite combinations which contribute to difficult and somewhat subjective pairings. What tastes good to you doesn't taste good to me. Think of wine as a condiment or just another ingredient to accompany the food. It's like putting ketchup on your hamburger. The quick fix approach to uh, wine and food pairings is Hey, drink whatever you want to drink, or which is true. If, that's, if you only drink red, my wife is allergic to white. That's all she's gonna drink. Don't matter what she's having. Fine, if that's what you like. If all you like is white, fine. Uh, but if they ask your opinion, you need to have an opinion if you're the server. So uh, the other one is uh, serve white wine with chicken and fish and red wine with meat. Okay, uh, whatever that helps, and and uh, to a certain extent that that certainly works. 
Um, but if that's not what you want to do, then don't do that. And there's certainly more refined methods than uh, white wine, because there's different types of white wines, different types of red wines. So we're going to go beyond the basics, but those are the basics. The analytical approach is broadening the quick fix perspective and approaching wine and food matching with some basic principles. The pairing can be less intimidating with some basic principles and less stressful and less limiting. You don't need to worry about it. You don't need to be the world's leading expert. You're not going to be a sommelier. But if you if you three or four times more knowledgeable after you finish this course than you were before, then you can do some great things and have some great fun with it and uh, have your guests enjoy a better experience with you. So you want to mirror the body and the weight of the wine with the food. Connect the bridge ingredients, compare or contrast the components of the food and the wine. So uh, you mirror the body, compare or contrast the components of the food and the wine. So uh, Googling is a wonderful thing. So I was, well, how do I explain what bridge ingredients are? So I just Googled it, and boom, there it is. So with Chardonnay, this uh, gentleman who provided the expertise says, one of my favorite bridge ingredients is toasted nuts, hazelnuts, pine nuts, and almonds. The nuts mirror the toasty, nutty character in many Chardonnays that come from barrel fermentation and barrel aging. They provide an aromatic and flavor bridge to the wine rather than a textural one. So that means you're going to put those nuts into the meal somehow, and then you have your Chardonnay, and you're going to get the uh, similar flavor. So they call it a bridge ingredient, bridging from the food to the wine, or vice versa. The principle one in the analytical approach is focused on creating an equal balance or mirroring effect, as we were just talking about on the last slide, of the body of both the wine and the food, so neither will overwhelm the other one. Example, a light to medium bodied white wine, Sauvignon Blanc, would be overwhelmed by a heavy dish such as grilled porterhouse steak with a melted blue cheese. Medium to full bodied red wine like Cabernet Sauvignon may overshadow a delicate dish of post scallops. So this principle one is don't overwhelm don't have one overwhelm the other, either the food overwhelm the wine or the wine overwhelm the food. Also uh, important is the type of food. In each dish there tends to be a core ingredient that's on display. Often it's referred to as the food type or the center of the plate item. That's what I call it. Most people call it. The main item that's on stage within the dish is that the center of the plate item is the determining factor in deciding what's an appropriate wine to go with it. Every food item is put into loose levels of the body, the consistency of it. The cooking methods and sauces can significantly alter the body and the weight of these food items. So light body foods would be things like vegetables, grains, pasta, chicken, turkey, mollusks, lean finfish. Medium body foods would be like veal, pork, crustacean, fatty finfish, duck, goose. And full-bodied would be like sausages, game, lamb, beef. So you can see what we mean by body, right? Obviously, a uh, sausage is heavier, stronger flavor than uh, chicken. And principle two is all about connecting those bridge ingredients we talked about earlier in food with flavors in the wine bridging the the flavors in the food and the wine. The ingredient that food and wine have in common. Bridges can connect the food type, cooking method, or the sauce of a dish to a particular wine. You would begin by assessing the primary flavors that are present in both the wine and the food. That's where all those descriptions uh, that we show you uh, come in handy. So there's an earthy flavor uh, to the uh, wine. You would want to find an earthy flavored food. Primary flavor of herbs can be evident in a food item, so that it's possible to pair a wine that has some of those same herbal qualities. 
a grassy herb flavor found in both the food and the wine. So this one's not so bad, the bad ones are coming Riesling. One thing I'll need you to do is say the words properly uh, so you can show that you have some sophistication and uh, you know you're getting paid one way or the other to do this so you need to be a little slicker than uh, or at least as slick as your um, clients so they may know how to say these so um, I've put phonetic uh, spellings up there so you can say them properly Riesling I think that's very important you, you just sound like a dummy if you say them Ries uh, Riesling uh, uh, Riesling or Riesling or whatever so uh, Riesling or something close to that would be good so Riesling is a highly aromatic grape variety with concentrated aromas and flavors lists that are some frequent though not exclusive aromas and flavors associated with Riesling so this is what I do want you to uh, remember for the test uh, fruit fruit tree peach apricot this is smells and flavors that you would get while drinking the wine pineapple raisins uh, a citrus flavor grapefruit lemon lime orange bake shop sauces, honey, minerals, petroleum, flint, steel. I taste them. I, I don't get that, to be honest with you. I can't pick up petroleum. Why would you get petroleum? Because the roots of the uh, vine are going down through uh, what might have been years ago petroleum. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, steel, whatever. Uh, so what I want you to remember for testing purposes is that in a Riesling, the uh, flavors that you would tend to come up with would be fruit, citrus, honey, and mineral. Why do you care? Because you're matching that with food. So if your food has a fruit, citrus, honey, or a mineral flavor to it, then they would uh, match well, right? And that's what we're talking about is food pairings. So uh, Riesling is a German style. Sweetness coupled with lower alcohol, 11% or less, allows the food to be fairly uh, food friendly. So it's a nice, it uh, goes with a lot of things, what is what food friendly means. It goes with a, a lot of things, sweet, some pairing strategies, salty, spicy, fatty, smoky, sweet foods. They vary in the level of residual sugar good with Chinese, Thai, Japanese. I'm not expecting you to remember all this stuff. I just want you to be exposed to this so that when you're wanting to serve something Chinese, Thai, Japanese food, you can go to the book and just look up Chinese, Thai, Japanese food in the book and you can Google it too. And I just want you to be aware that this is how you pair things. Riesling's intense concentration, aromas and flavors uh, makes it work good with duck and goose and pork. So just know that all this stuff is in the book, so you wouldn't remember any of this, and I don't need you to remember at the moment any of this for the test. But they can couple with dessert options, fruit-based, so just be generally aware. And you'll use your book later on, and, and you're not going to know all of these. You're just going get to a, get a few. Um, get a sweet wine, a dry wine, a, a, a acidic wine, you know, maybe get five, six wines that you're really comfortable with and do that. And then you can grow over time.